so welcome everyone to the second yes. part of the semester's distinguishing series. This is the main scientific event at our institute, uh, the Max Planck uh, for the Science of Light. Um, this due to the circumstances in a virtual format that this allows us to also welcome uh, external attendees, so particularly welcome uh, to them. I just remind you that this event will be recorded. And also I would like to remind the people uh, from MPL to stay after the talk and the discussion because there will be information of the, on the upcoming election for our CPT scientific uh, representatives. So as I understand, there will be a small information section, um, session, um, some, uh, our current representative Tobias Utica will give a brief report of his work in the last three years and the uh, candidates uh, for this time uh, will be, so they will present themselves. So please uh, stay online. So and now uh, it is really a pleasure to, to have uh, with us uh, Professor um, Stephanie Benner. She's a professor uh, in quantum information at the Delft University of Technology and a research lead of the quantum internet division there. She um, did her PhD in the Netherlands in computer science, um, moved as a postdoc to Caltech and then further as a professor in Singapore before coming back to the Netherlands. Um, but as I learned before all that, she worked as a professional hacker in the industry. So this is quite uh, interesting. So she's an expert in quantum information and uh, quantum cryptography. Uh, moreover, she leads the European efforts toward, uh, towards a quantum internet in the form of the European Quantum Internet Alliance within the EU uh, flagship uh, for quantum technologies. Uh, she's a leader in the field. She received uh, the prestigious Amodo Science Award in 2019 for her contributions uh, to quantum information theory and in particular uh, for um, real life real world applications of uh, quantum cryptography. So we are really um, looking forward to your talk and uh, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much, Sylvia, for the kind introduction. And uh, thanks also to all of you for inviting me. Um, I wish I could be there in person, but uh, next best thing is at least to be there virtually. Um, so let me get started. Um, here, let me shift this to my other monitor. Um, so I want to talk to you about, about uh, our, uh, well, some of uh, the efforts um, in my group to work towards a blueprint for a quantum internet. Um, so before we get started with this, I wanted to ask a question because it occurred to me that despite us being separated by this virtual distance, we can nevertheless communicate uh, at least over the classical internet and via the chat. So before we get started, I have a question to you, namely whether someone can tell me what happened on this day in 1969. Good ending. So I guess it's unusual to ask questions on the, on a video call. <laughs> you have answers in the chat. Yeah. Okay, so we have a few contenders. So the one of them says that uh, there's a landing on the moon, which is not so far away from this date. The ARPANET was launched. There was a note to note, which is also quite close. First electronic message. Question how that's defined, bit by bit, L or transmission. Very good. <laughs> so I think uh, the combination of this, will last the last one, indeed gives the correct answer. So because on this day in, in 1969, oops, in fact, the first message was transmitted over what is now the internet, and thereby called the ARPANET. So the ARPANET at this point was still quite small, so you can see a little bit picture of that here. And um, uh, uh, you can see that people also worked quite hard on this at the time. So at, uh, at half past 10 in the evening, the first message was sent. And in order to verify that the message was co correctly transmitted from Los Angeles up to Stanford, they actually called each other on the phone. So they ask you know, a person sitting in, in Los Angeles says, you know, we typed the L and to verify, they said, did you see the L? I said, yes, we correctly saw the L. So they typed the O, and they ask on the phone, did you see the O? And the answer comes, yes, we can also see the O. 
So they typed the G and the system actually crashed. So we know, all know that um, uh, classical communication has improved significantly since then. Um, uh, and what I want to talk about now is to, uh, to advance communication com technology even further um, to ultimately realize a quantum internet. So quite possibly before this talk, you went to the, yes, to the classical internet and you Googled quantum networks and you find a picture that may look like this, uh, saying, aha, there is already a link apparently between Beijing and Shanghai. So maybe um, uh, if you've been trying to find out what is the state of the art of a quantum network, indeed such networks already seem to be in existence somewhere. So importantly, um, what we want to achieve here, and I'll talk more about this later, is a true quantum network that can transmit quantum bits or qubits or produce entanglement uh, between uh, both endpoints. So what's happening here, if, in case you Google this before my talk, is actually not end-to-end -end quantum communication in that sense, but say two parties, say Alice and Bob, one located in Beijing and Shanghai, um, can use a friend in the middle and that is close enough such that each of them can perform, for example, quantum key distribution um, with the intermediate friend. So they can use this to, um, uh, for example, perform quantum key distribution to distribute a secure key between Alice and this intermediate station, the intermediate station and Bob. And this then allows them to perform end-to-end -end encryption, basically encrypting the message from Alice to the center station, center station to Bob, um, using the keys uh, to protect the communication between the two lines. But of course, we all know how this ended. <laughs> so um, uh, the objective that I want to talk about in this talk, in case you wondered whether quantum communication networks already exist, is to go beyond that. So what we don't want is networks that rely on uh, to do quantum key distribution on the trust of this intermediate agent, also called trusted repeater network. But what we want to achieve really is end-to-end -end communication of quantum bits or the creation of entanglement. So before zooming this a little bit more into detail, let me draw a cartoon of what such a quantum network actually looks like and the terminology also that I will use during the talk. So in a quantum network, just like in classical networks today, um, we have something that we like to call an end node. So an end node is nothing else than say your classical laptop or your phone that connects to the network on which you can run specific applications. So these networks end nodes may of course um, have a variety of uh, levels of complexity. On the one hand, they may be quite simple photonic devices that, can, that are capable of preparing and measuring qubits. And they may also have some quantum memory, so they allow the storage, uh, storage of qubits. There may even be small quantum computers that allow the execution of quantum circuits, so the manipulation of qubits on the end nodes. Uh, and in fact, they may ultimately possibly even not just have noisy qubit, but really allow fault tolerant quantum computation. So in a quantum network, just in a classical network, what appears is, for example, switches to maximize use of infrastructure and crucially um, uh, contain something which is called a quantum repeater. So I assume that a lot of you actually are familiar with the concept of a quantum repeater, but the objective of a quantum repeater is to extend the range over which quantum communication can be performed. So I'll give an example of such a thing actually later. Um, so uh, a quantum repeater, as you may be aware, works quite differently than a classical repeater, chiefly due to the fact that quantum information cannot be copied, also ruling out signal amplification as a means to bridge long distances. All right. So this is where we need to construct to, in order to bridge long distances. Of course, there's also classical control of these nodes. All right. So before talking about these things a little bit more detail and giving maybe some examples of such um, end nodes or repeaters, um, let me discuss a little bit briefly why anybody would actually want to build such a quantum network. So in order to think about this, we've um, some uh, two years ago now introduced some application driven stages of such a quantum internet. So the way that you should be thinking about it is purely from the perspective of what can a user actually do if such a quantum network were to be built? 
So this means basically what applications can be running at these end nodes, inducing, of course, some requirements both on the technology of the end nodes, but also at the technology of the cloud that I pictured here that may deliver qubits or create entanglement for them. So we've introduced these stages of development. So the, the, the top one um, that I've already given an example about is a trusted repeater network, which is um, not allowing for end-to-end -end creation of entanglement. So the first stage of such a quantum network is what we call prepare and measure. And I want to maybe have a look at the first stages here to explain a little bit more what I'm talking about. So let's imagine that we have two of these end nodes. So the way that a prepare and measure network is defined uh, means that very roughly speaking, it allows for the um, a sender to send and for a receiver to measure single qubits in a post-selected fashion. So this means that for any pair of nodes in the network and any uh, one qubit state that they prepare and any, also any one qubit projective measurement that they may uh, perform, there exists a way to prepare the state, transfer it over the network to the receiving node such that either the measurement is, pre is made correctly or the uh, node act the receiver actually concludes that the state was lost. So this means that there's a post-selection involved. So one can then think about, well, if we were able to achieve this, what is such a network actually good for? So one thing, for example, that can be done with such a network is quantum key distribution. And there's actually several other examples of uh, protocols that can be run on such a protocol. Uh, for example, uh, secure function evaluation, meaning problems where actually the sender and receiver don't trust each other, secure identification, where the sender wants to um, uh, identify herself uh, with a password, position verification, or um, other sort of cryptographic building blocks like uh, versions of coin flipping. So importantly, maybe, is that this means that one in this stage, one cannot transmit arbitrary qubits from I to J, because this uh, would require uh, the would necessitate that we can do this transmission in a non post selected fashion. Okay? So for these application protocols, it's fine. But for example, to do teleportation, deterministic teleportation of an unknown quantum state, this of course does not yet work. So the next one, uh, which we like to call entanglement distribution networks, meaning means that actually one can produce entanglement between these two nodes in a way that is heralded, meaning that there exists a signal, a heralding signal, and conditioned on, the, on that signal, entanglement distribution is deterministic. So examples of protocols that fit in that stage is, for example, device independent versions of the protocols that I've just mentioned. So going ahead, sort of towards a quantum memory network. Um, here, in fact, the end nodes themselves are much more sophisticated and can actually perform quantum computations on a small number of qubits. So um, we call a network a quantum memory network. If for any pair of nodes, the following tasks, the network supports the following task in any order. The heralded generation of an entangled pair between uh, any of these nodes, preparation of an ancilla qubit, measuring the local qubits at a node, and now crucially also the application of an arbitrary unitary by the nodes, so a quantum computation, and a storage for an amount of time that allows for classical information to travel between back and forth between the nodes, and also therefore the local quantum computations that are being performed at these nodes to depend on signals that are sent from the other side. So with this, um, I guess the first one is not technically an application, but note that in this regime, one can actually then perform um, a teleportation of an unknown quantum state deterministically. It also uh, supports uh, an advanced selection of uh, cryptographic protocols, certain agreement protocols that keep data consistent in the cloud, and for example, secure access to a remote quantum computing server. So I have here a few more examples, actually, of what can be accomplished in these stages. So higher stages are much more futuristic, requiring then also fault tolerant computation. Okay. So maybe this is a little bit of a background of what we actually have in mind when we talk about, let's go and build a quantum network or an interconnected, uh, several interconnected such networks, meaning a quantum internet.
So I wanted to give now some examples um, of work um, that I decided not to talk about, <laughs> and then actually zoom into more detail into what I thought was maybe more interesting and most interesting to you. So going forward, um, what we would like to do, I guess given that true quantum networks don't yet exist, is actually advance quantum communication in three directions. So the first one is um, what we call functionality, meaning what you can actually do with that network. So we want to be able to run ever more sophisticated application protocols. The other one is um, accessibility. So meaning that we would like to undertake some efforts to you know, make that actually take the step from say physics experiment to some technology that more people can use earlier. And distance, meaning that we would like to eventually <laughs> also perform end-to-end -end quantum communication over arbitrary distances. So I want to give now some examples of the first two and then talk a little bit more about the last one. So in the domain of functionality, uh, in a collaboration with my experimental colleague, Ronald Hansen, we've recently uh, in, created a quantum processor network of three nodes. So this is a system based on nitrogen vacancy centers in diamond. And uh, the nice things about this <laughs> is that in particular entanglement is being produced between two nodes, which are not directly connected via an intermediate node. So this process known as entanglement swapping is, forms an essential ingredient in uh, bridging long distances. Um, but also to, given that these actually are quite sophisticated nodes that can perform quantum computation, to run in the future more sophisticated application protocols of such a network. So as an example of such capabilities to support more complicated application protocols, uh, we also create a multipartite state, a GZ state, um, between the three nodes. And crucially for the performance of such applications, um, this also does not involve any post selection. So I just want to mention it here. I'm not going to talk about this in detail in this talk. So accessibility means that we want to take a step from a sort of physics experiment to actually something that could become a quantum network system and be used by many people. Uh, so this involves actually many aspects. And one of the aspects um, uh, that I'm also quite interested in is actually an efficient control of such a network. So this is a much more computer science oriented adventure um, where recently we have also proposed a quantum network stack. So you can see a picture of that here. And the idea behind the quantum network stack actually comes from classical networking with the idea that um, maybe you don't want to know if you're say programming an application, what is the actual physical mechanism that is used to transmit the sort of bits that are currently recorded on my computer to uh, the computer that you're watching this talk on. Um, so this means this is an approach that is a sort of, let's call it a task division, and that allows for the efficient control of such networks. We're starting at the physical layer, meaning that this is the physical medium over which uh, signals are sent. Um, for example, possibly your laptop is connected to Wi-Fi, so Wi-Fi is uh, 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 so in this case, a radio signal is uh, an example of a physical layer on which these bits can be sent. On top of this is what is called a link layer. And classically, a link layer is responsible for making sure that these radio signals that you use to communicate to your Wi-Fi base station actually form a robust communication channel. So this means that, for example, errors are detected. And um, if an error occurred, then a transmission occurs. So this is called the link layer because it Makes, takes, makes robust the physical connection between two nodes connected by a direct physical medium into one much more robust communication channel called a link. So based on this, one can then have a network layer that then arranges, dictates how communication is proceeds by two nodes which are not directly connected by a physical medium, but by one intermediate node. So, in the quantum regime, um, there's a very similar picture, which you can also see here, where basically the physical layer is the quantum device layer. The link layer is um, a, a protocol that basically works on the quantum, sits on top of the quantum device layer and makes entanglement generation robust. So for example, 
uh, in the case of uh, uh, the, the example that I gave you before, where two network nodes, for example, using nitrogen vacancy centers in diamond, want to produce entanglement between them. The physical mechanism for this does not always succeed. So there's um, um, uh, an attempt, basically. There's a notion of making an entanglement generation attempt that does not always succeed. And what the link layer, for example, amongst various other things does, is to retry until success has been achieved and then allow also the have enough information available for the applications to consume that entanglement without any need for further communication. So just like in the classical domain, the network layer is responsible for dictating how nodes can talk to each other that are not directly connected to a physical link. Also, our quantum network layer is responsible for producing entanglement between two nodes that are not directly connected. So the transport layer and the application layer, I guess, uh, um, application layer is, if you're an expert in quantum information, something that you're already quite familiar with, um, in the sense that the bottom part of this picture is very quantum. So this is actually where the physics happens. The top part of that is very quantum information, where you know we like to write down protocols on papers that look something like Alice sends M Q it's the Bob, and then they apply unitary. Um, and in the middle, there's um, this sort of connecting part actually of classical control that connects the quantum device layer to these application protocols. So we've uh, actually introduced the world's first quantum link layer now actually uh, uh, about uh, one and a half years ago. We also have some follow up on that, but I don't want to talk about this now because it's quite computer sciencey. But if you're curious about this, you can also download my ACM tech talk. So what I want to talk about here now is about uh, the, the third um, axis, so to say, of this diagram, namely is how can we increase the distance over which quantum communication can be performed. And so I give you on the right hand a very non-exhaustive list of numbers, but to give you some idea of what the distance here actually means for people who are not quantum communication experts. So on the ground, uh, if you're interested only in, in running a single application protocol, quantum key distribution that allows secure communication in a way that cannot be sort of extended um, easily. Uh, in say deployed fiber, the distances bridge are roughly 100 kilometers um, commercially in the lab. By commercial devices in the lab, much longer distances have already been overcome. Entanglement had also been produced between two quantum memories, um, uh, for example, in Delft over um, 1.3 kilometers and uh, or in uh, say longer distance have been bridged for devices which are actually not at the physical distance but in the same okay. so there are there are many more efforts but i just wanted to give you some numbers so to say to give you some ballpark idea of uh, what can actually people do now when i talk about distance so in space, entanglement has been uh, produced in a post-selected fashion over actually a larger distance uh, of 1,200 kilometers. So this is sort of say how far we can go now. And of course, the objective is to bridge larger distances um, in more efficiently, meaning also with a higher entangling rate. Okay. So the question that we would like to ask is, you know, ultimately we want to deliver entanglement for everyone, but the question is sort of how can we at all make this possible? So it's a quite big challenge to go from these numbers on the right to something that actually can bridge sort of distances which are much larger than this and really create entanglement between quantum processors that can also you know, run more sophisticated applications over uh, hundreds or potentially thousands of kilometers. So the question that I want to sort of discuss a little bit in the remainder of this talk, and where I also want to present a series of tools, which I thought have more, more synergies with what uh, some of you are interested in, is how can we actually try and build such a quantum system? So for this, we've um, uh, developed a series of some of the more analytical, some of the numerical tools uh, in order to find a blueprint so a sort of suggestion for what such a, a quantum network architecture could actually look like. And in this talk, I want to 
I present you these tools in the hope that maybe you find them also useful. So maybe to be clear, so what we want to achieve here now, the starting point is we want to, um, uh, is an input actually as a real world network topology, so a description of a fiber grid. So for example, here is one from the Netherlands, from Surfnet, which is an educational fiber provider in the Netherlands. And the output should then be, how are we going to uh, enable communication between the users of this network? All right. So to give you a bit of an overview, what we are going to do with this real world topology is first taking that uh, fiber grid, we have a bit more uh, quite some information, namely we know where are the fibers and we also know where can quantum nodes and where could quantum repeaters potentially be placed. So for example, here on this, um, on this example that you see here, um, uh, say the orange ones are the users and on all the circles we could place a repeater. So for this, we've developed an integer programming algorithm to, that can be used to optimize um, uh, placement of repeaters on some existing topology. So given this sort of relatively rough pre-optimization of the decision where we're actually gonna put these repeaters, we can then study much more detail of how the system would be performed with these specific repeater locations. So for this, we've developed a simulation platform uh, based on an idea actually that uh, comes from classical networking and a discrete event simulation. And if you're curious about this, you can also download it later. Now, once we have a simulation running that you know, tells us how a specific type of repeater in specific locations would actually perform, we can then uh, try and actually optimize and find out, answer questions like, well, how would we need to improve this quantum hardware in order to actually achieve a higher entangling rate or for the moment at all enable quantum communication over longer distances. So for this, we've built some parameter optimization machinery using machine learning um, that works on top of the simulation platform. And that can be then used to um, study things like what are the most important parameters to, um, to tweak in order to enable useful quantum communication. All right. So I want to now give you an overview of such tools Oops. in the remainder of this talk. So let me start with the first one, namely this, the first step basically that we do. So given a fiber grid, here's an example, and given location where network nodes might be passed, where are we going to place these repeaters? So the orange squares on this network here perform quantum communication. So say these are the, these are the users in this example, someone randomly selected. And on the circles here, this means that, okay, so in this location, we could actually put a quantum repeater. So the question is now, where can we place such quantum repeaters such that user requirements are met, but the total number of repeaters is small? Okay. So let me maybe be very clear, what is the input and output of this algorithm? So on the one hand, we are interested in some level of robustness, meaning you know, maybe even if some um, paths are unavailable, we still want to be able to communicate. We want to produce entanglement at a specific rate, let me for the moment just say one hertz. Uh, we want to produce entanglement at a specific fidelity. Also input to the algorithm is of course the network layout. What does the network at all look like? And uh, in this rough pre-optimization, also some ballpark estimate of how good the quantum hardware is that would actually be used to enable this communication. And also something which we call the repeater capacity, which is actually part of the potential hardware, meaning how many in entangled links can it produce uh, simultaneously. So the last one is um, in all actually practical experimental proposals for now just one. Um, but of course, you know, if we develop such an algorithm, we can also do this. Okay. So the output of this algorithm says, then says, you know, at which places in this network do we want to put these repeaters such that entanglement can be um, distributed at the required rate and fidelity and the network has the required robustness. So I'll give you just an example to understand just what a solution of this kind of looks like. So for example, here, um, 
we would say, aha, so in order to connect these orange nodes with a, to achieve an entangling rate at one hertz that just allows you to do QKD, we would like to put repeaters in these blue stations. So I want to say a little bit more about this method, even though I don't want to, um, uh, to zoom into too much detail. So what is the idea behind this method? So um, given a sort of minimum rate and fidelity that is sort of, remember that is the input to our algorithm, we want to be able to communicate at a specific rate and fidelity. Um, and using a specific repeater scheme, so here actually this, the hardware is fixed, remember that it's also an input to the algorithm, one can translate this actually to a maximum number of repeaters that can be between a sender of repeater and the maximum elementary link lengths, so elementary link lengths here being the following, so if this is a, uh, an end node, an orange one, and um, another one, an orange one, and here is a repeater in the middle, then the elementary link length is just simply the distance between the orange node and the repeater and the repeater and the orange node. So maybe for people who are not so familiar with quantum repeaters, why um, is the number of repeaters and the maximum elementary link length sort of can that at all capture something about, not everything, but something about the rate and fidelity. So you can imagine that as the longer the elementary link length is, the um, the uh, longer it takes actually to, to produce entanglement, so the lower the rate becomes. In fact, the rate decays exponentially in the length of the fiber. And the uh, sort of why a number of repeaters is important in the sense that every repeater is a little bit noisy. So you can think that actually if there's too many of them, then also the quality, so the fidelity of the entanglement that is produced um, cannot be high enough simply because there's too many noisy steps in between. So the second step in this kind of um, algorithm is then to, um, to have a pass formulation. So let's say we have a network here, just a cartoon of it, an orange node, and white nodes in the middle. One can, of course, do maybe set up the following optimization problem. So you know, for each pair of nodes, we're going to compute all the paths that link them. And then for each path, we determine whether that's chosen or not, so zero and one. And for each location, we're going to say if there's now a repeater or not. And then we're going to optimize over all the path and all the repeaters and add some constraints capturing the number of repeaters and links. So this is a great idea. This also works and one can do that. Um, and one can solve it using an integer linear program and optimize the total number of repeaters. Um, but of course, uh, there is an exponential number of paths that link uh, each of these nodes. So if you're curious about this, so we then perform a little bit of a trick where we uh, show a mathematical equivalence between this path-based formulation that is intuitive, but unfortunately has a number of variable, exponential number of variables, to a link-based formulation, where actually we introduce a variable only for each link and each repeater location. Right. Okay. So for some of us, some of you who are maybe familiar with uh, these type of optimization methods, you may say, wait a minute. So an integer linear program, meaning a generic optimization method, actually there's a generic algorithm that can use for that, that optimizes over integers. So in this case, zero one variables, repeat or not, is has still an exponential scaling. But in practice, um, indeed, one can then use some tricks that come from operations research, for example. But this can um, is easily tractable for over hundred nodes. And given that you know the largest networks now contain roughly three nodes. Um, uh, this still works quite well to investigate quantum network architectures. Okay. So if you're curious about these optimization methods, you can read more in our paper. And I now want to say a little bit more about the simulation platform that we've built, which actually can be used for quite many things. And then give you some examples actually of how it can be used to, um, to study potential quantum communication architectures. So NetScript stands for Network Simulator for Quantum Information Using Discrete Events. And it can be used for all kinds of things to simulate the, the, the physics of the devices, to investigate the control plan in the section of these two, all the way to studying how well can a particular quantum application protocol actually perform on a specific type of uh, quantum network. So it can uh, capture physics up to, of course, the model that you create. 
Uh, and in particular, we have built a simulation platform in order to understand timing be dependent behavior in the network. So it's quite modular. Um, so basically you make Lego blocks um, and it is also scalable. So let me say a bit more about what this means. So quite important in such a network are timing effects. And this comes from the fact that that actually already also arises in classical networks, that if you a network very quickly becomes quite complex and exhibits sort of emergent behavior that is very difficult to understand um, analytically. And in order to do this, to understand timing behavior, dependent behavior, uh, for example, um, how much is, how relevant is the quantum memory lifetime that is used as a quantum repeater, if I have to wait for some signals coming from somewhere else. Um, and for this, there exists a specific methodology using the paradigm of discrete events. So I'll say a little bit what this means. So in a discrete event simulation, you basically program only what happens when an event occurs, and there's no continuous evolution in the simulation of the continuous evolution. And instead, the simulation basically then jumps from event to event. So for example, to make a somewhat um, um, pathological um, example, if in NetSquid you would model a source, so you would make a model for a source, you would make a model for a fiber, you would make a model for a detector, you link them together, then, and let's say that if the detector clicks, we're going to trigger some specific control action, for example, just to uh, trigger the source again. Then basically the, um, the way the simulation works is just to define how these components react on specific events. Um, so basically, uh, if, say the transmission would reach the end of the fiber, <laughs> or at least in simulation, basically, um, um, uh, uh, potentially also to, um, to go into the stochastic model, be, be done, then an event is invoked and um, the detector basically simulation starts. And then if the detector produces a click, basically the, the simulation of the control action starts and so forth. So this way one can uh, Lego together large simulations from small locations and understand also without sort of having to do it manually, uh, how timing dependent behavior can affect such a simulation. So I've already mentioned a bit that this simulation is quite modular, so you can make models for different hardware and then Lego them together in a complex simulation. It is quite fast. Um, so just to give you some runtime comparison about sort of producing a GZ state using number of qubits. You can switch between the two different types of um, uh, from simulation paradigms using either full, full uh, uh, sort of CAT formulation, meaning the waveform, or density matrix, or which of course you can express anything, or to do a much more um, uh, efficient stabilizer formulations. So what that's good, so what we've done internally is actually that we always try and shrink the state whenever we can recognize that um, two quantum systems actually uh, are no longer entangled, and this allows the simulation to proceed quite efficiently. So just to give you some idea of possible uses, so we can study repeater design, we can uh, study hardware parameters, and if you're curious about this, you can go to our website and also try a simple example. So I now want to give you some example of what you can do with, uh, with such a simulation platform. Also to give you maybe a little bit of a taste of what people are exploring when they talk about quantum repeater systems. So for example, one might ask the very simple question, can there be a single repeater um, um, that uses quantum memories? Actually the primary use case here is atomic ensemble memories, but it's not so important for this question based on the, that uses actually SPVC source and linear optics, um, uh, can that actually repeat, meaning can it do something useful over distances of 300 kilometers? So let me be a bit more clear here. So I've already shown you this earlier picture of the orange node, two orange nodes linked to a repeater. So that's the same picture as here. So on the left-hand side, um, there's a node, we call it A. On the right-hand side, there's a node called it B. And there, connected via this intermediate repeater station called R. So the setup here is the following. So at A, there's an SPDC source that emits both to the quantum memory and the central beam splitter station, the same as the repeater, um, and also 
that B. So conditioned on the on the uh, detector clicks here, uh, one creates probabilistically but de deterministically conditioned on the on the on the specific event pattern uh, entanglement between these two quantum members here. That can then be done by another entanglement sort of swap in the middle, uh, produce end-to-end -end entanglement. So one can now ask the question, for example, if everything here was perfect, everything works totally perfectly, um, just to give you a simple example, is it at all possible uh, to use an SPDC source to ever sort of uh, build a useful repeater using such a server? So the answer of this, in fact, one can then very quickly label a simulation together and check that indeed, even for otherwise perfect parameters, using an SPDC source in this setup actually never leads to repeater. So if you haven't seen these kind of plots before, there is a benchmark actually that says when a repeater is useful for doing quantum key distribution, um, uh, where one is interested in looking at the following. So if this is the total distance between the sender and receiver, this is the rate at which they can produce secret key, so perform quantum key distribution. One would like to be above this um, uh, blue curve, but as you see in this simple example, we never get above. So this is just a you know a little toy example, but it basically very quickly already tells you that you know this is not enough. But at least in such a scenario, one would also need some other tricks like a number of photo, a number resolving detectors, for example. Okay. okay. Uh, one can also, for example, then have a look. Well, well, if I had photo number resolving detectors, and in this toy example, they're actually perfectly photo number resolving. And one can now see when can I actually get across that, and now one can see that this actually becomes possible. Okay. I don't want to talk too much about this, but just to give you an idea of what can now be done using this platform. I want to give you maybe one more example um, that is kind of cute, um, where people are interested in the following question that has not been proposed by us, but we study it then using this as an example in the simulation platform. Let's say that I have a quantum switch, so here called switch node, uh, with the goal to actually produce uh, GZ set states between the end nodes connected to it. So here A, B, C, and D. So what it can do in order to make that possible is actually to produce bipartite entanglement between B and the switch. Uh, and it can do so in parallel, actually, in this specific example. Uh, but the switch cannot, at the same time, to say, store more than a certain number of entangled pairs. So people have actually studied this analytically. And of course, with a simulation, one can now easily go beyond this analytical regime. So for example, here, if you're considering sort of what is the size of the state actually at these leaf nodes, or the end nodes, uh, here are some analytical bounds, and one can then be with a simulation. So in this case, the orange points here is the mean, um, see that in fact one sits below. One can then, of course, also investigate some more quantum things, such as people who study these classical uh, switches from a purely classical perspective have, you know, um, have not been able to do, uh, namely to understand sort of what is actually the fidelity of the state of produced and not just how fast can we produce them. Okay, okay so just to give you some examples. Um, of what the simulation platform can do. Uh, and now I want to, in the last remaining minutes, briefly give you an idea of how one can then use parameter optimization on top of this simulation platform in order to uh, say something about how one needs to improve quantum hardware in order to attain certain targets. Okay. So, uh, what is going on here? So I want to talk about a method using genetic algorithms um, in order to then, on top of the simulation platform, uh, um, find minimal requirements to bridge long distances. So maybe to be clear, what do I mean by minimal requirements? So of course, one needs to define them. So abstractly, of course, they're just some set of parameters, which are called x1 up to xn here. And minimal requirements would meaning basically the worst set of parameters uh, allowing, for example, for secret key to be produced between the rate of one hertz, between, for example, here Delft, and this is a picture of a dust city called Eindhoven, using, for example, three intermediate repeater stations. So, of course, there's a little bit of a question of what is here worst. So, our machinery, um, if you're curious about it, can in principle work with any cost function. Um, the one that we use is actually one of diminishing returns. And I want to 
Oops. Um, maybe give some examples then of how this works precisely. So because I want to make a simple example, I will not consider a very detailed physical situation, but let's consider a very simplified abstract model of what these quantum network nodes would characterize as these network nodes. So first, let's say that um, in this simplified model, entanglement is produced along an elementary link. So remember, this is basically from a repeater to an end node or a repeater to, a, to the next nearest repeater at some fidelity f that may depend on the distance. Uh, some success probability p, meaning that this is the probability that if I make one attempt to produce the entanglement, I succeed. And some swap quality s. Uh, so this one can model as basically mixing with my noise when I make a, a swap and the t1 and t2 times. Okay. So just as an example, so t1 and t2 capture basically, these are numbers that um, uh, quantum information people love that uh, capture the defacing uh, and the damping, uh, and so t, t2, the defacing time, and the t1 uh, of amplitude depth. So what we do is we use a genetic algorithm to basically evolve to a better population. So the population here is characterized by these um, types of parameters that characterize the devices. And um, we're interested in, if I start with a specific set of parameters, how can I evolve to a different set of parameters, uh, meaning a specific set of hardware characteristics of these devices that on the one hand, say achieves a secret key rate of one hertz, and on the other hand also minimizes the cost. So note that minimizing the cost here is important because of course one way to do it was just make the parameters perfect and then we could achieve anything we believe. So basically, on a very abstract level, how this works is that um, um, uh, we set up basically a specific um, set of parameters, we run the simulation outcome, we evaluate the cost function, and then basically we evolve to the next population with genetic algorithm. So like I said, we can principally use any cost function. As an example, we use one of diminishing returns. So meaning that small improvements are easy and large improvements are hard are costly. So if you start, for example, for some baseline, that if you wanted to approach perfect parameters, it looks something like this, where the cost of one parameter here is just one over the logarithm of this base value and the required value. So like I said, one can use any particular cost function, but we've decided to use this as an example. So we do quite some evaluation of these genetic algorithms using some mechanisms actually that come from the genetic algorithm literature that checks sort of how well, does the algorithm perform on noisy data, which is sort of important here. And we also sort of validate it, for example, on the quantum regime, where we can analytically compute what's happened. So for example, for a case where the states that are produced are what's called Werner states uh, at equidistant uh, setups. And there we can see, for example, that already after a few generations, uh, we converge quite well to the optimum. Okay. So maybe to be perfectly clear, basically, so what is the input and output of this procedure? So the input that we then use is a starting value, like the parameters as they are today, for example, a specific situation in simulation, for example, here simulation of connecting the off to Amsterdam, a specific target, for example, let's say we want to produce entanglement rate of one hertz with fidelity 0 0.7, and then the output is basically a new choice of parameters, minimizing the cost that achieves these target requirements of the fidelity and vector. So we're currently using this actually to study quite large network architectures. Um, uh, if I visit you in person, I hope maybe I can talk about it in the future. And, um, oops. and uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stephanie, for this uh, very nice talk. Um, so you can either type uh, for questions, so type Q in the chat, or um, and then I will unmute you, or you can directly write the question in the chat and I will read it out loud. So Florian, you are the first one. Oh, I think there was someone before, right? Uh, ah, really? Well, you're already muted, so go okay. ahead. Uh, anyway, so really great talk. So I have a question about this discrete event simulation because I assume 
that has to do with timing of events. So after five milliseconds, a photon arrives and so on. And so I wonder, these timings may be correlated. They may even be correlated in a quantum way. I mean, I could have time bin entanglement stuff. That would make everything really hard, wouldn't it? Yeah, so um, uh, so it is, uh, of course, like the question is a little bit, what is the granularity of this physical model? Mm -hmm. So because we are interested in studying quite large network architectures, um, uh, we, we do do some simplifications, of course, um, in such a way that we can Lego large structures together. And then indeed, oh, there's only one single instance that determines the event. It is, however, if you're curious in using the simulation, possible to um, define events, one event that have to depend on several other events. So this does allow you to express uh, sort of correlation actually between events, uh, because only if, uh, if they say, for example, both occur, <laughs> uh, another event sort of say is triggered. So this, this is not excluded in the simulation, even though uh, it does require some thinking how to express it. <laughs> okay, 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 I see. Okay, uh -huh, thank you. So I will read uh, here a question. Uh, so this may just be a naive question, but could you briefly discuss about the application of the theory in the context of matrix for biological systems, specifically about the main difference between Isenspeed model and the quantum model? One key feature is entanglement. Could there, could there be other system level key components which might be involved in determining the stochastic output of the system? So I think there's maybe a few aspects to this question. <laughs> so first of all, I should tell you that actually, I don't know anything about biological systems. So I think we have an expert here in this call, Jochen. Um, who knows all about them. <laughs> so I don't want to claim any form of applicability to biological systems. Maybe there is one. Uh, maybe one can use these discrete event simulations to also understand communication between biological models. I don't know. But given that I don't know anything about them, I'm a little bit hesitant to speculate about this. Um, so then there's more about this question. Uh, could you talk a little bit about main difference between the Ising one and the quantum model? One key feature is entanglement. Could there be other system level key components which might be involved in determining the stochastic output of the system? Hmm. I'm not entirely sure that I understand the question um, in relation to this talk here. Um, of course, one could talk a lot about the differences between the <laughs> classical and quantum spin models. Um, but again, like with the biological systems, I'm not so sure that we've really made a contribution to that in, in this particular um, research. Uh, uh, so Durje, you have to unmute yourself, I think. Uh, yeah, basically, I'm sorry. This is just a thing that I was working on. So I thought there might be some application, but uh, I understand the, your, your point that you you don't work on this system. But yeah, thank you. <laughs> sure. yeah. Uh, the other question is what kind of impact has uh, quantum computing of the internet of things? So that is a very complicated question. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, of course, there are several things to be said there. So um, given that, of course, even your toaster talks to the internet today, one can, of course, ask oneself, like, um, uh, is there any form of security when your toaster talks to the internet? This may maybe not so relevant for your toaster, but for example, maybe you don't want your neighbors to look at what your scale is saying in the bathroom. You know, like um, maybe not only your toaster, but also scale in your bathroom is talking to the internet of things. Uh, there may, of course, also cameras in the house are connected, um, uh, even microphones in your house are connected. And of course, then you might be interested in what are the security concerns for the internet of things. Um, of course, it is the case that if a large quantum computer could be built in the future, um, uh, one could potentially break the security of the connection that your microphone has to the internet. Of course, um, uh, that would necessitate that someone records that communication now, or of course, I guess someone makes the effort to, um, to listen to that. So first, first answer is, that um, on the security aspect, of course, quantum computing does have a 
impact on all things related to security. Maybe on the positive side, one could ask, do mechanisms in quantum communication, chiefly quantum key distribution or quantum security, can they um, uh, also actually help with security? So of course you might imagine that, um, that uh, one could even do things like quantum key distribution on a device connected by the internet of things. Uh, but of course, at least um, that may in many cases be quite challenging because they are connected uh, rem remotely or like not using a physical medium, but um, not using a, let me say, physical medium like fiber, uh, with which one can, um, would then actually easily be able to perform quantum key distribution. Not sure that this answers the question, but uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pascal? Um, yes, maybe I can ask the question directly. So uh, yeah. thank you very much for the really nice talk. Um, I have one question regarding this uh, quantum stack that you presented. Yeah. Um, and I was, I was wondering, would it somehow make sense to have the application layer not talk to the quantum layer via all these, um, via the whole stack, but rather have kind of, uh, but rather have kind of a twofold branch where the application layer has kind of a disconnected or a separate connection to the quantum layer to make sure that there's no crosstalk or some security infringements via the classical layer. Yeah. Um, so that's an interesting question. And there's a, actually a number of aspects to consider there. Um, uh, on the one hand, um, one might think, aha, if I connect the application directly to the, to the, to the layer below, maybe things can be more efficient because uh, note that it might, for example, mean that I could do what happens now in, in most physics experiments showcasing quantum demonstrations. I will tune my experiment for the specific application. So it is clear, just to be perfectly clear, that of course, by doing these abstractions, one always loses something in performance because basically there's one system that supports any application. So let me say that at the beginning. The reason why one doesn't sort of like to do that classically or in practice, uh, that motivates actually the introduction of such stacks um, is because things become extremely complicated if every part of the system needs to be considered for everything. Um, so it is, has been in practice been very convenient to introduce these stacks because it also does not just have a sort of technological benefit, but it also means that uh, not everybody needs to know everything and everybody can work somewhat independently on different things. Uh, you know, um, it means that, you know, I can improve my Wi-Fi system while uh, someone else can improve your web browser. You don't actually need to talk to each other. Mm -hmm. So that's maybe one motivation of why one wants to do these things independently of some security constraints. So now the coming back to the security question, that's of course a very interesting one. So like um, the question is, uh, by doing some sort of generic mechanisms for in that Marshall entanglement distribution, you might be worried, for example, um, uh, is my application still as secure as if I implemented it directly? Um, uh, for example, you might be saying, aha, if I do quantum key distribution, which of course, you know, requires not so much uh, um, stack on top, um, uh, is this system, is my QKD system still secure? Yeah, um, I, think, I think my question was mostly whether it makes sense to have two separate stacks for the, for the classical communication and for the quantum communication. Ah, okay. I see, I see, I see. I see. Kind of, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so, uh -huh. so that's, that's a very good question. Actually, sorry, I didn't, didn't uh, precisely get your question. So the answer is actually yes. So um, the, uh, the, it makes perfect sense to separate the classical communication from the quantum communication here. Um, uh, because it does, it is also not necessarily even the case that, say, the classical signals travel via the same path, so to say, as the quantum signals. Um, uh, I can give you maybe a simple example. So let's imagine that um, that I have a network actually where I just produce a point-to-point -point entanglement. Uh, so you can think, but the fiber that runs in the ground typically is, for example, also longer than uh, than. Um, then say, for example, how I could communicate through the air, say. So in this case, it's a, let me call it toy example of where even separating the classical uh, stack and communication from the quantum one can even be beneficial. 
because in this case, for example, I could, I don't know if, how familiar with heralded entanglement generation, I could even receive the heralding signals quicker through the air rather than if I, if I go, the, go through the fiber, um, which also means that I could sort of um, uh, trigger again entanglement emission uh, earlier than if I had waited through the fiber. So of course the difference is very small, <laughs> um, but this may be also a practical example where it's not just even convenient, but maybe also practically useful. Does that answer your question? <laughs> thank you. Yes, yes, thank you very much. So Gerd Leux asks, um, does your analysis of a quantum network include aspects of quantum error correction? Uh, so in the um, uh, in the simulations that we've done now, uh, no, but it is actually possible to do that, and other people have done so in some unpublished work using our simulator. So there's also one-way quantum repeaters that actually are uh, based on forward error correction. There exist various proposals, for example, using quantum dots. I'm not sure you're familiar with them, um, and this also can be expressed in the simulator. Um, Thanks. Okay, so I have a question. <laughs> if there are no, uh, no upcoming questions. So, um, in, what are the most promising candidates for quantum memory realization? So, you mentioned uh, spin ensembles. But... So, I have to say that given I'm uh, not an experimentalist myself, I always like to be a little bit diplomatic on this point. Um, uh, so, I think, to be honest, I think. In my mind, this is very difficult to tell, right? So um, there's various efforts uh, on the repeater side, for example, using atomic ensembles. Uh, they have all kinds of challenges. Um, there are proposals also, of course, using ion traps, for example, neutral atoms and color centers in diamond. Uh, that, uh, for example, also color centers in diamonds having very high coherence times, but at the same time also having other downsides like um, um, uh, uh, it's very difficult actually to entangle them very quickly. So entanglement generation rates are very low. Um, so given that I'm not an experimentalist, I try to, um, let me say, not answer these kind of questions. For me, actually, this question is actually not just a question of the properties of the physical system, even though, of course, you know, physical system itself must cross a certain bar. So it needs to be good enough. But it is also a question of how intensely one works on something. So in my mind, the system that at least I think uh, ion traps, color centers, all of these are very nice. All of them have ups and downs. Um, uh, but I think the winner, so to say, will certainly have one property, namely that intense focus has been in, um, uh, uh, dedicated to the system. Yeah, I'm not an experimentalist, so you know, I like to be. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I guess it is, it is, it, it's good because you, you know you don't have a preferred candidate, so you're not uh, <laughs> so in this sense you're an impartial person to to ask your impartial opinion on on a system. Uh, and the, the well, other... I can add something to this. So the reason why we are conducting now these actually quite intensive simulation efforts now that we've you know built this machinery, um, this is also what what I want to know. So. Um, so we would like to really gain some much more concrete insights into how far these systems can be pushed uh, to maybe maybe narrow down the, the space uh, of what to explore. Yeah. And I have a last question that might be, oh, yeah, I, 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 I'm not sure even if the, the answer is known, but suppose that the, so when we'll have a, 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 a quantum internet that replaces a, our classical and internet, how will be that? So the energy consumption. So how, in terms of energy uh, cost, um, is this? How does it compare to our current uh, classical computing and classical internet? Yeah. So maybe it is. Um, it's it's kind of important to keep in mind. So the perspective is here not that the quantum internet will replace the classical internet, but rather that it will supplement it with some extra things that we couldn't do before. Um, so, um, you know, because there's no need, I mean, in many situations, you don't need a quantum internet and you don't, don't maybe need to rely on it. With respect to power consumption, I think all of this is maybe to be seen somewhat in relation to what one wants to achieve with things. 
Um, uh, so, for example, if you look at um, efforts where it's a question of, you know, how much power do I invest to what kind of applications do I support with it? For example, if, I if you think about performing a quantum computation or using a network, a computation on a remote quantum processor, um, the use case for that is to do something that is more difficult than a classical supercomputer. So in that sense, the power comparison is more to say a supercomputing center to what I want to do with this computation rather than to your laptop at home, say. Of course, if you say, you know, I want to have a quantum device at home, maybe to do quantum key distribution in the future, then of course you also need much less power because it's not such a complicated device. Um, so in my mind, that's uh, I would I would not think of this as a problem, so to say. Even though, of course, one should maybe keep in mind how much power is being consumed. So thank thank you very much. Um, it seems that there are no any more questions. So yeah, we thank you um, again for this very nice talk. And I just remind everyone from uh, the Max Planck uh, to stay online. And yep, so I, I clap like this. <laughs> yeah, very nice to see you all. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hopefully at some point in person. Yeah, see you. <laughs> Bye -bye. Yes.